Hello, I'm Clayton White, the Rose Brown Endowed Chair for Pediatric Orthopedics at Children's Hospital Colorado and Professor of Orthopedics as well as Genetics and Metabolism at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. Today, I'd like to speak on the subject of short stature and when to consider skeletal dysplasia, or as I like to say, when I hear hooves and think zebra. Skeletal dysplasia are genetically determined disorders of bone. They result in generalized skeletal involvement, which tend to evolve with growth and time. Universally, however, they result in short stature. There are over 400 described skeletal dysplasia, of which over 90% have an identified causal gene variant. There are several red flags to look for when one is to consider a skeletal dysplasia. First and foremost is disproportionate short stature. Other clues may include bony of the legs, kyphosis of the spine, or what we call a gibbous deformity resulting from vertebral body hypoplasia, or radiographic findings of bilateral birth disease or proximal femoral osteonecrosis. Short stature comes in many forms. There are normal variants, such as familial short stature, or constitutional growth delay. There are other forms of proportionate short stature, including those associated with syndromes, congenital heart disease, inadequate calorie intake, or endocrinopathies. But as I mentioned, these are all proportionate forms of short stature. Skeletal dysplasia are uniquely disproportionate in their nature. When working up a child for skeletal dysplasia, one always starts, as we should with all our patients, through a good and thorough history and physical exam as well as a systems review. Radiographically, the first test we want to perform is a skeletal survey. And one may want to consider doing segment measurements as this can help narrow your phenotype. A skeletal survey consists of a minimum of a lateral of the skull, a full AP and lateral view of the spine, an AP of the pelvis, a single view of the forearm and hands, as well as the lower extremity and feet. When considering skeletal dysplasia and the workup of a child with short stature, one must always do a thorough history and systems review. Questions such as, is there a prenatal growth retardation or is there a preadolescent growth retardation? One should measure head circumference as many of these skeletal dysplasias present with macrocephaly. Other organ systems may be involved. For the pulmonary system, there may be restrictive lung disease. There may be abnormalities of the ear, nose, and throat systems and there may be endocrine differences. Physical exam is best performed starting with segment measurements. The easiest of which to perform is an upper to lower body segment measurement. In this measurement, the provider measures the distance between the pubic symphysis and the floor. And then taking that difference between the overall height, that gives you the trunk length and the lower body segment. In infants, this is generally a ratio of 1.7, meaning that the child has much more trunk length than lower extremity length. In the adult, however, this becomes a one-to-one -one ratio. So when examining this parameter, beware that upper to lower body ratios are different as the child grows and matures. Another measurement, arm span to height ratio, tends to be relatively one-to-one -one throughout growth, however. It is always helpful to take an arm span and compare that to the height. If one wants to do a more detailed segmental analysis, one can look at length of the proximal segment, which is the upper arm or the thighs, the middle segment, which is the forearm and the lower leg, or the distal segment, which is the hands and the feet. When we think about disproportionate short stature, we talk about short trunk dwarfism, and we talk about short limb dwarfism. Short trunk dwarfism tends to be more associated with severe spinal deformities, and as such, is associated with respiratory failure. Examples of this include Morchio syndrome, spondyloepiphyseal dysplasia congenita, and metatropic dysplasia. The short limb disorders include the most common form of skeletal dysplasia, achondroplasia, and its more mild variant, hypochondroplasia. Less common forms of short limb dwarfism include diastrophic dysplasia and pseudoachondroplasia. The mesomelic disorders are generally less common and involve Shock's gene abnormalities. Turner syndrome, in which one of the X chromosomes is missing entirely, and therefore missing one of the alleles of the Shock's gene, is the most common form of short-limbed mesomelia. Larry Will dyschondrosteosis is a gene variant in which the Shock's gene is mutated but presents in both alleles. Finally, 
The least common form of dwarfism is acromelic short limb disorders, Ellis Van Crevel disorder, Albright's osteodystrophy, and brachydactyly, all of which are primarily manifested in growth of the hands and the feet. So when would one want to refer for evaluation of skeletal dysplasia, either for clinical evaluation or genetic testing? Clearly, if a child has a skeletal dysplasia that has not been identified molecularly, that would be a reason to refer. However, in the examples we are speaking about today, the previously undiagnosed form of short stature, one would want to look for the red flags that were mentioned previously. Again, this would include disproportionate short stature, bilateral hip osteonecrosis or Perthes disease, or vertebral abnormalities which result in lumbar gibbous spinal deformity. Skeletal dysplasia testing strategies vary, but oftentimes, at least in our hands, one would start with a urine substrate analysis to make sure that there is no glycosaminoglycan or GAG accumulation in order to identify a mucopolysaccharidosis. These are treatable disorders and test results can come back pretty quickly using this strategy. One must be aware of false negatives, however, in this disorder in mild forms of the disease and later presenting forms of short stature. The workhorse of diagnostics at this point, however, is molecular gene panel testing. Gene panels represent a molecular diagnostic group of genes including anywhere between 10 and hundreds of genes, which represent a group of phenotypes that are similar in their presentation. These panels are good for picking up single gene variants, but limit the number of uncertain results that one might obtain as compared to an exome sequence. There are still incidental findings that one must be prepared to answer and deal with, however. Whole exome sequencing, on the other hand, is very popular nowadays, but presents with a number of challenges. While it's very powerful, it actually analyzes all known genes in the human genome, about 20,000 of them. But with this increase in the number of genes examined, has a much higher incidence of secondary incidental findings, which one must be able to be prepared to contend with. Because of this, one must expect variants of unknown significance and be prepared to offer genetic counseling. With that said, it is detailed enough to pick up single gene variants in patients who do have a skeletal dysplasia and can be useful in that regard. So things to consider before genetic testing, or at least before referral are, is there a family history? Are there inheritance clues to narrow down the possible diagnoses? What is your differential diagnosis? If it is something simple like achondroplasia, then single gene testing is very appropriate. However, in most cases, this is not the scenario, and a skeletal dysplasia gene panel is probably the most appropriate test. Another important question is, will gene testing change clinical management? Oftentimes it will. One must be prepared for surveillance needs, such as patients with type 2 collagenopathies, who have a high risk for retinal detachment and need to be followed regularly by an ophthalmologist. But there are many other findings in skeletal dysplasia that we must be prepared to contend with, such as respiratory differences, or ear, nose, and throat differences. One must consider, can a diagnosis be made by other means? Can we shorten the time to diagnosis by either doing urine gag analysis, serine enzyme analysis for MPS, or other forms of testing that are faster than molecular testing? And finally, families are often concerned whether they have a high risk recurrence for future children. So when we are talking about family planning, it may be important for them to know whether a skeletal dysplasia gene is identified, thus allowing us to identify what the recurrence risk is for their future family. Most importantly, one must know, is the family informed and interested? Because this can be a very arduous and psychologically taxing road to embark upon if the family is not truly informed and interested. So in summary, skeletal dysplasia result from genetically determined changes in bone development. They can present more or less at any age, but most commonly are prenatal or neonatal presentations, and less commonly present just before preadolescent growth spurt. The red flags to consider for skeletal dysplasia include, most importantly, disproportionate short stature. But the presence of bilateral Perth disease or thoracolumbar gibbous deformity are also highly important. Physical exam and skeletal survey are critical to narrowing the diagnosis and help guide the diagnostic testing, which at this point includes, most importantly, a gene panel for skeletal dysplasia, but may include urine substrate analysis or enzyme testing.
I appreciate your time and attention. If you have any further questions about this video or any of our other videos, or if you'd like to refer a patient to our Orthopedic Institute at Children's Hospital Colorado, please feel free to refer to the information on your screen.